Today on Northo 2, we are going to be talking about the canid family. There are 34 species of extant canids, ranging from the giant wolf to the tiny fennec fox. They are a very successful group in modern times, and they were also very successful in our distant past. During the early Eocene, the order Carnivora split off into two main groups, the Caniforms and the Feliforms. The Feliforms would become cats and other lineages, while the Caniforms would become canids. Prospero Sion was the first true canid and it appeared about 40 million years ago. What made it different from the previous myocids was the loss of the upper third molar and an adaptation to the ear bone. This allowed this early canid to have a more shearing bite as well as better hearing. With this strong bite, it could break bones and get at the nutritious marrow. These two adaptations seem to have been what made this group so successful. In the late Eocene and the early Oligocene, the canid family split off into three subfamilies. The Hesperocyanids were the most basal lineage out of the three subfamilies. The first Hesperocyanid was Hesperocyon. It was a small canid that was about the size of a raccoon. It had weird features like retractable claws and a cat-like tail, but if you look at its mouth, it was definitely a canid. 28 known species evolved from Hesperocyon. The Hesperocyanids were typically small, raccoon-like dogs. They were a successful subfamily, but never seemed to have reached the success of the other two subfamilies. Borophagine was the next subfamily to split off from the Hesperocyanids. This group is commonly called the bone-crushing dogs because of their ability to crush thick bones. The most basal species in Borophagine was Archaeocyon. It was a rather ordinary canid lacking any defining feature. From what we can tell though, it seems to have been more carnivorous than Hesperocyon. It lasted for 8 million years and would give way to 66 more Borophagine species. The dogs would not get really big until the Miocene. Apiocyon was one of the first truly bone-crushing dogs. It was about 5 feet long and 200 to 300 pounds. Though 5 feet isn't long compared to modern day wolves, it was very heavily built. It had a massive head and powerful jaws. Its head looked more like a lion than a wolf. The fossil range of this animal is from Alberta all the way to California and then to Nebraska. It, like many other Borophagines, was likely a mix between a predator and a scavenger. The dogs were not just killing the animal, but utilizing all of the carcass they could. A. Lurodon was another genus of bone-crushing dogs that shared its habitat with Epicyon in the Middle Miocene. They are much like Epicyon, but a smaller size of 120 pounds. Many think that they hunted in packs like modern-day wolves. Borophagus is the most advanced and latest surviving genus of Borophaginae. It was not the largest bone-crushing dog, but it had the best teeth for crushing bones. It was originally thought to have been a scavenger, but because of its abundance and large geographic range, many have changed their mind. It was likely an effective pack hunter if it wasn't a solitary hunter. Those three species were the biggest and most unique Borophagines. Hesperocyanids and Borophagines were two great canid subfamilies, but not as great as the third. Canines are the third lineage to split off from Hesperocyanids. This split happened in the early Eocene and they are the only surviving group of canids. I know I have said these three lineages in order, but they actually all coexisted for a very long time. So Hesperocyon was the oldest canid species, but shortly after it appeared Leptocyon. Leptocyon is the first species that is thought to fit in the subfamily Canidae. This means that it is likely the ancestor of all modern day canids. In many ways it was like Hesperocyon, but had a few adaptations that made it unique. During Leptocyon's time, the subfamily Hesperocyonae went extinct in the middle Miocene. Leptocyon existed from 30 million to 10 million years ago, and then it gave way to the very successful Eucyon. Eucyon evolved 10 million years ago and lasted until about 3.6 million years ago. It existed at a perfect time because not only was it able to cross into South America, but it also could cross the Bering Land Bridge into Eurasia. During the Pliocene, canines expanded their range all over the globe. Most of them were small fox-like animals, but Eurasian canines were able to grow much larger. These were the first wolves, and some of them came back over the Bering Land Bridge at the end of the Pliocene. By the Pleistocene, there are wolves in many parts of the globe and countless other species of canines. Also, during the Middle Pleistocene, the subfamily Borophagine went extinct, meaning that the Canine subfamily was the only group of surviving canids. During the Late Pleistocene, dire wolves and cave wolves appeared. The cave wolf, scientifically known as Canis lupus splaeus, were large wolves that inhabited Europe during the Late Pleistocene. There's not been a lot of research about this animal, but it was larger and more robust than modern wolves that inhabit the area. 
It survived in Europe for a long time, but was ultimately replaced by smaller, more modern wolves 23,000 years ago. On the other hand, we know a lot about dire wolves. Dire wolves were a very large species of wolf that inhabited North and South America during the Pleistocene. Dire wolves on average were about 150 pounds. Now, that may not sound like a lot to some people, but trust me, that is huge. Just to put into perspective, the average wolf is about 88 pounds. So on average, dire wolves were 62 pounds heavier. And just for scale, look at how big modern day wolves are. The largest confirmed wolf ever was 175 pounds, so just think of how big the largest dire wolf could be. If the same ratio was applied to the dire wolf's average weight, then a dire wolf could weigh almost 300 pounds. I doubt that one would ever weigh that much, but just to show you how some wolves are way bigger than the average, and some dire wolves could easily have been 200 pounds. Dire wolves are not actually much taller than modern wolves, but they are much heavier and more robustly built. They were great predators for their time, but of course they eventually went extinct and ended up being replaced by the gray wolf. So now that you have a rough outline of the history of canids, let's talk about humans' connections to dog, and then we can talk about modern canids. I don't want to go in too much into depth about this topic because I might save it for a future video. So now let's talk about when humans domesticated dogs. Us humans have domesticated plenty of animals, but wolves are definitely the craziest animal. Just think about how much humans hated wolves in the Middle Ages. We would track down and kill them for many reasons, and one of them is because they actually ate us. It was not uncommon for a small child or even sometimes a full-grown adult to go missing and be found killed by a pack of wolves. They were our enemies and embodied so much of our fear. It is sort of ironic how people had dogs as pets at this time, yet still hated wolves with a passion. We hated wolves for much of human history, but of course, we also domesticated them. The consensus is that we domesticated wolves 40,000 to 20,000 years ago. This is a rough timeline that we know encompasses the domestication. Wolves are the first animal that we domesticated and are still the only large carnivore we have domesticated. Wolves are amazing animals. There are 28 recognized subspecies of wolf. The wolf is currently the largest member of the Canidae family. They are similar to coyotes but feature a broader snout, larger and heavier bodies, shorter ears, a shorter torso, and a long tail. They are slender but powerfully built. Their long legs help them run long distances and keep up with their prey in deep snow. On average, adult male wolves weigh 88 pounds, but the heaviest ever recorded was 175. Wolves are very successful in the wild and have certainly helped Homo sapiens survive. The question we will really never get an answer to is how did we domesticate wolves? We likely lived around wolves enough that they became accustomed to us. Wolves are incredibly smart animals and you would think that they would have seen us as a competitor. I think that wolves saw how intelligent we were and were curious to be our allies. I can't even imagine what the first people were thinking when these killing machines became their friends. You know how scary a wolf is? It's not like your little poodle, but a full-size killing machine. Many think that wolves had a very profound effect on humans. We might have seen nature in a different way and certainly hunted different. So like I said, the first dogs could have been domesticated as late as 40,000 years ago, but we think by about 20,000 years ago they were already our companions. The oldest undisputed remains of a domesticated dog were a 14,000 year old dog called the Bon Obercastle dog. These remains are amazing. Two humans were buried in a grave along with their supposed pet. One human was a 40 year old man and the other was a 25 year old woman. The dog was rather young at about 20 weeks old. It was suffering from canine distemper which is a viral disease. During this dog's life it must have been under intensive care or else it would have died sooner. At no point in this dog's life, it would have been able to be of use to these people and it would have just been eating food and wasting time. But these humans cared for this dog and loved it unconditionally. What I am puzzled about these remains is who died first. There are three people in this grave and from what I found they all were placed there at the same time. Perhaps the man died and as horrible as it sounds, maybe they killed his acquaintance to accompany him in the afterlife. I really don't know what else could have happened here, but it seems to be a beautiful display of human affection. Rather a gory one, but still very beautiful. Many don't know this, but dogs are actually all one species, and that is Canis lupus familiaris. Though they have an incredible diversity in appearance, they are actually not that different. A Great Dane can reproduce with a Chihuahua. The reason they can do this is because they are artificially evolved by us humans, so they didn't actually get very diverse. So now that we have talked about wolves and dogs, let's talk about modern wild canids. There are multiple groups and 12 extant genera of canids. 
Here's a chart of how they are all related. Canini is often referred to as true dogs. This group encompasses most of the species you probably know, like the African painted dogs, wolves, coyotes, dogs, and more. Vulpini is another group that is home to true foxes. Some other groups have foxes, but Vulpini has most of them. The last main taxonomic group of canids is Eurocyon. Eurocyon includes two species of basal foxes. I am confused on why these species are not in Vulpini, but I think it is because of how old the two species are. Now that you know how they lie in relation to each other, let's talk about individual species. So first let's talk about the African painted dog, or also known as the African wild dog. Full grown males weigh about 75 pounds. Though they are relatively small, they make up for it in numbers. Their packs are huge and with large numbers they are able to fight off other carnivores like lions and hyenas. They have the most unique and diverse coat color of any wild canid. This coat color helps them camouflage and blend with other wild dogs. They lost their dewclaw in order to have a more efficient stride, and they kill their prey by running them into exhaustion. Only about 6,000 individuals remain in the wild, and they continue to fall due to disease, human intervention, and habitat destruction. The next canid I will talk about is the coyote. Coyotes are relatively small at about 44 pounds for adult males. Though they are small, they are very smart and can take down animals much larger than them like deer. Here is a picture of a deer that was killed in my backyard this year by coyotes. It only took them about 5 minutes to bring down this deer and they spent the rest of the night fighting over the carcass. I hardly ever see them around, but they are always somewhere. Here is the only video I have ever been able to take of a coyote. This coyote was hunting mice and ended up getting a few. Since the wolf was killed off in much of North America, the coyotes were able to take their niche and become very abundant. The next canid I will be talking about is the tiny fennec fox. The fennec fox is the smallest species of living canid. It only weighs about 1.5 to 3.5 pounds full grown. They eat birds, rodents, insects, and eggs. The desert is their home and they construct very large complex dens that can have 15 different entrances. So canids are a very successful group comprising of many extinct and extant species. They have an amazing history and helped Homo sapiens become so successful. This here is my pet canid. Look at how great he is. So, thanks for watching the video, and check out my subreddit. We hit a thousand subscribers, so again, thanks. Hopefully we can hit 2,000 soon, huh? I'll see you on the next episode of Northo 2. See ya.